Welcome, welcome to Easter at Discovery. We've had some packed services so far. This is what it's all about, man. It's all about uh, Jesus, that we have a God who, not, hey, he's the only one. A lot of people like write checks that they can't deliver. You know what I mean? Their mouth writing checks they can't deliver. But Jesus is the only one who not only predicted his death, but he predicted his resurrection and pulled it off, man. And this is the reason why we celebrate uh, church and services all across the nation and world on Sundays, because Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday. And today we celebrate that, man. And really excited to celebrate with you Easter at Discovery. Before we jump into the message, do me a favor and inside of your bulletin should be one of these Easter response cards. Go ahead and grab that, if you will. Pull that out. Even if you're part of the family here at Discovery, take part in this. All my dream team, everybody, if you can pull this out. Um, this isn't a gimmick. This is something we do every year. Every year we do this annual Easter response survey. And if you're wondering why, it's because this is the day of the year that you all decide to attend church on the same day. And there is no other day that you all decide, but this is the day. So it really helps us shepherd you, lead you to get some of this information from you. A lot of you, 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 you can, you've moved and stuff like that and didn't tell us. You can update your information and your email address and all that. Go ahead and fill that out. But I really want you to answer that question at the bottom that says, the next step in my spiritual journey is... Okay, and so this is really going to help us lead and pastor you well. Every one of you has a next step in your spiritual journey. And it may be you're here today, you may say, you know, I just need to get closer to God. There's a spot for you. Maybe it's, it's that you need to get baptized. You know it. That's your next step of, of faith. It might be, you know, joining a church. And it doesn't even have to be this one, just a church. You know, hey, I'm not connected. I need to, that's my next step. Or maybe it's a group, a community to belong to, or even making a difference somewhere on a team or serving somewhere. Here's, here's what I want you to know. There is always a next step for you. Like you, you have not experienced all there is to God. Can I get an amen? Like there is. That's, that's why we name Discovery Church Discovery, because we are on this constant, continuous journey of knowing God and knowing who we are in Christ. Like it's, it's this uh, progressive journey and you continue to experience all that God has for you. Now listen to me, this is why it's important, you guys, important for you to understand, that the things God has for you are not good for God, they're good for you, okay? Like the things that God has for you, it's not for God's good, it's for your good. And if you would ever buy into this faith thing, this Jesus thing, this resurrection thing, if you ever buy into it, you'd discover like, wow, this actually works. Why didn't I do this earlier in my life? Um, and the way I like to say it is, you give, give God one year of your life, and it's not even going to take that long, but give God, just give God a chance. A lot of you have given your life, time of your life, away to a lot of different things. You've given it towards your career or success or people and relationships. Here's what I want to challenge you to do this Easter. Give God a chance. Just give, give God a chance. Give Him, give him a year. You won't, it won't even take that long, but I promise you, if you give it to Him, you just do, like run the play. If, if there's a service, go to it. If there's a group, go to it. If there's a conference, attend it, whatever, like we've designed here for your spiritual journey at Discovery, like do that. And I promise you, it, you, will, you will find out that it's not perfect and it's not problemless. It's better. It's better. See, Jesus came to make your life better and to make you better at life. The Bible actually says that those planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. Literally, that word means green and alive. Like God wants your life to flourish. He wants you to experience life and life abundantly. And the reason why that's important is because a lot of people have a faulty perception about God and about church. A lot of, and I don't know whether maybe you were raised in church and, and, and you kind of had some experiences that developed the perception you have of God or of church, or, or maybe you've never been to a church and, and you're just coming today. Um, we, we get a lot of people that come to discover that's never been to a Christian church at all. And, but maybe your perception of God or church is, is, is faulty. And a lot, of, a lot of people think that God is like this angry old man in the sky. Okay? Or maybe you grew up in a religion or in a church or some sort of atmosphere where going to church for you was like your weekly spanking. Anyone ever been there? Just your weekly, you know, where God was like, behave yourself. This is how you mess up, and this is what you need to do right. That's not the God you and I serve. That is not, that's a faulty perception. Here's the faulty perception, that people believe that God came to make 
bad people good. That's not, that's not it. God did not come to make bad people good. And if there was ever an Easter message, it's this, that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That's the message of Easter. That's the, re- that's the day we celebrate this resurrection Sunday. That, let me explain it to you that God wants to take every area in your life that is experiencing decay, that is dying, your, dr- your, your dreams, your, your, your relationships, the er- your hopes, your, your, God, wants to, God wants to bring life to every one of those areas. He desperately wants to revive the dead and dying areas of our, of our lives. In fact, I've done a lot of funerals in my time in, in ministry, as you can imagine. And oftentimes when I'm doing these funerals, and I know we don't like to think, we don't think about this often, we don't like to think about it, but it's honestly healthy not to obsess over death, but to think about it from time to time. And I think on Resurrection Sunday, it's a, it's a good time to think about it. Anyway, I'm, oftentimes I'm doing these funerals and and, you know, they're eulogizing the person. They're telling stories of the person. And oftentimes I'm thinking, like, man, there is more life in this person in the box than there is out here in the audience. Like, the, the dead person is alive, and the alive people are dead. You see, Jesus wants to bring the dead, not the physically dead areas, but he wants to bring those dead and dying areas in our life. He wants to resurrect them and bring them back to life. Um, there, there was a story I heard of these three guys. They were at a, at a, at a funeral, and they were standing... Um, in front of the casket, and, and one of the guys asked his two friends, hey, um, what, do you, what do you want them to be saying about you when it's your turn in the box? And again, I know a lot of us don't like to think about that, but just go there with me today. What do you, what do you want them to say about you when you're in the box? What do you want to be known for? And one of the friends thought about it for a moment. He said, you know what? I want to be known as a family man. I, I want them to say he loved his wife well, he was loyal. His kids loved him so much, and, and, and he loved his kids, and he was such a great family man. The other man thought about it, and he said, you know, I, I want to be known as someone who made a difference. I want to be known as someone who put others before himself. I want to be known as someone who, who actually was seeking to serve and, and civic-minded. It just made a difference in my community and the people that were around me and anyone I came. I, I want to be known as someone who made a difference. And then he turned to the friend that asked him, he said, what do you want to know when it's your turn? When, when, when you're in the box, and he said, that's easy. I want them to look down at that box and that casket and say, look, he's moving. <laughs> Come on, somebody, that was funny, man. I don't care what you say, that was funny. All right, let's get into the Bible now, all right? This is my favorite, my favorite Easter verse of all time is Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that says this, check it out. The Spirit of God, or, or the amount of Spirit, or the power of the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, look, you can have that too. Like it lives inside of you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, look what it says, He will, and that's, I got, I got just a few moments to convince you of that today, that He can and He will give you life. And that word life in, in the New Testament, you know, it's translated to English, but the original language is, is Greek. And that word life in the Greek, it's zupeo, and it literally means to germinate as in a seed, to cause a seed to come to life. Say seed. seed. See, God, God has placed something inside of you that he wants to cause to come to life. He will give life to every mortal area. He wants to give life to your mortal dreams. He wants to give life to your mortal marriages, your mortal emotions. Every dead area in your life, he wants to bring life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The way I like to say it is this, that the resurrection of Jesus gives you the power to close the gap between the life you are living and the life deep down inside every one of us knows we could live. And I've got a few minutes to convince you of that today, that Jesus came to rescue you from this place of death. And so some of you might say, well, Jason, what's the catch? What do I have to do to experience that, to have that? Because a lot of people are asking that question because they think, a lot of people think that God is requiring more from them than he actually is. Because we read the Bible and these stories and they're almost unrelatable people to so many 
of us. He's like, how can I even relate? Those are like apostles for heaven's sake. And they did, they were amazing people of faith. And how can I even relate to them? I want to show you that you, you can relate to these people in the Bible. They're not special, much more than you think. Look at what the apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. He said, we don't want you to be in the dark. One translation said, I don't want you to be uninformed about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. He said it was so bad that we didn't think we were going to make it. One translation, it says that we despaired even of life. And that's the biblical phrase for we thought about suicide. So they got to this point that they were despaired. They, they thought of ending it all. But he said, we felt like that. We felt like we'd been sentenced to death row. That it was all over for us. I don't know if you've ever been to that place in, in your, maybe in your marriage. Or you feel like in that place where it was just all over in your dream or in your hopes or in your life. It's just like, it's, it's done. This is over. And he says, as it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. How in the world did it go? Did that despair turn into the best thing? How did that happen? He said, because instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. That's, and, and what do they trust in? They, don't, what do they, they trust that it's not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. So when I thought about my God and how he conquered the grave and he rose from the dead, and I, I, I knew that there was nothing that I could not conquer in my life. That's what he's saying there. I knew it. And he did it. Look what it says. And he did it. Rescued us from certain doom. And he'll do it again. Turn to your neighbor and say, he'll do it again. Come on, he will. He'll do it again, rescuing us as many times as we need rescuing. See, here's the faulty perception of what God, of God listen, God is not mad at you. God is not mad at you. He, he loves, like he desperately wants to rescue you. He desperately wants to bring life to every dead and dying area. He'll do it as many times as you need. That's so important for you to understand because some of us, we, we stay away from God, we stay away from church, we stay away from faith or believing because we think that God is mad at us and it cannot be further from the truth, you guys. It can't be further from the truth. Isaiah chapter 46 prophesied, God prophesied through this prophet long because this rescue plan was in motion since the beginning of time. Look, I, look what God said through the prophet Isaiah. He said, I have made you and I will carry you. Look at that promise. Hey, when you feel like life is too heavy, hey, I made you. I had you in mind. I planned you. No, no, mom and dad didn't. I, I, I used the I made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. It's a promise of God. He desperately wants to come through for you. He wants to rescue you. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 17, because again, some of us think that these people in the Bible, they're so unrelatable. They're like, I mean, they, they must pray a lot. Oh, they, they pray a lot more than I even want to pray. They must read the Bible a lot. They must, look, at they're just amazing people. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 17 says about Abraham, who's considered the father of our faith. This is what the scriptures mean when God told him, Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. Now, what motivated God to do that special thing for him? Was it because Abraham was special? No. It says this happened because Abraham simply believed. He didn't have all the answers. He didn't figure it out. He didn't, he didn't pray enough, read the Bible enough. He, he, didn't do, he didn't know how God was going to do it, when God was going to do it, why God was going to do it. He, and by the way, God will rarely answer all those questions for you. He just simply believed. What do you believe? He believed that he was serving an Easter kind of God, that he served a God that, that brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Are you hearing me today, church? This is the God that we serve. So what do you have to do? What do you have to do for your life to experience this transformation, this resurrection power to, to get this better life? It's my deepest hope is, uh, this, that this service, that you would experience belief. That's it. And some of you, that you would just believe again. Because chances are there was a point in your life where you had, you had high hopes. You had hopes. You had you had your future ahead of you, but then life happened and robbed you of your hopes and stole your dreams. And what I'm hoping today is to create an atmosphere and an experience for you to just believe 
again, to, to, to believe God. And I, and I want to show you one more story. And if you've been in church for a while, you probably have heard this story uh, before that I'm going to teach you. There's actually um, three recorded instances in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that, that Jesus raised a dead person to life. Like, like Jesus did a miracle, and he took someone who was dead and brought him back to life. There's three recorded instances in the scriptures. There's probably many, many more times that he actually did that, but they recorded three of those times. And I want us to study today the resurrection of Lazarus. John chapter 11, and you have some handouts, are up here. It says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. So they would have, they would have sent a telegram, right? They would, have, they would have gotten on some papyrus, wrote, wrote on some paper, sent a telegram to Jesus. He would have probably been in Jerusalem at the time and got a word to him about Lazarus. Now I want you to notice the word. Notice the language she uses. She writes this to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Notice what she didn't say. She didn't say, Lord, the one who loves you is sick. And because he loves you and he prays a lot, man, he pray, he's up before all of us. He's always praying. He reads his Bible so much. He serves so much, gives so much, goes to church so much. Man, because he loves you and because he loves you so much, God, that needs to motivate you to love him back and come to his rescue. I want you to see this. This is a theological truth that you need to receive today. Listen, God is not motivated to rescue you because of your love for him. God is already motivated to come to your rescue because he loves you. You need to know that, that it doesn't depend actually whether you love him or not. It does not change God's love for you and his motivation to come to your rescue. The one that loves that you, that, that you love is sick. And then when Jesus heard this, it says, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. And if you've re read the story, you, spoiler alert, he died. <laughs> but notice he says, it, didn't, it will not end in death. Like, I don't know if you've ever felt like it was over and like it was the end of something. And, and, but listen, it's never over in God's kingdom. God says, hey, it may look like, but it's not going to end that way. No, he says, it's actually for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, which is really, I think, important to go back to that real quick. It's really important to, to that John kind of is letting us know something here. He's trying to let us know, hey, he loves them. Now, why is he trying to remind us again, hey, Jesus loves Lazarus and Mary and Martha? Because the next verse it's going to look like Jesus doesn't love them. So, so John wants you to know, hey, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and, and, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Have you ever felt like uh, God was delaying his response to you? Like, like, he, like he doesn't really care? Like, like you, have you ever got to the place where you're thinking, okay, Jesus, if you're going to come through, it's about time. Let's go, let's go, let's go. It's, it's the end. If you're going to come through for my marriage, if you're going to come through for my health, if you're going to come through, come on, God, it's now, it's now. I don't know if you ever get irritated with how slow God is. Can I tell you something? It, God is probably a lot more irritated with how slow you are than you are with how slow he is, okay? But in the midst of all that, usually what's happened is that there's a bigger picture going on in our lives, and God is usually at work within us, developing something bigger than the needs that we're asking for. We're asking for this, and God says, huh, no, I'm actually thinking of something bigger for your life. And it says, after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and he's using his own language now to explain what's happening here, because Jesus sees differently than we see. He describes it and sees it differently. He says, he's fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And then his disciples replied, I love this, Lord, if he sleeps, won't he get better? I mean, what's the, what's the, why do we got to rush off? Jesus had been speaking of his death, though. I want you to see this because sometimes we, we will argue with God and we'll get in uh, an, a debate. Like, you're, we're reasoning with God based on our limited understanding. 
Sometimes we'll try to reason with God based on our intellect. Oh, God, don't you really want to do this instead? God, if you're going to move my life, isn't it supposed to look like this? Don't you want to in this way, in this time? And you have no idea how God is actually working on your behalf. Watch how the story continues. Jesus had been speaking of his death. Go back for me. Jesus had been speaking of his, of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Continue. So then he told them plainly. He said, okay, let me just tell you plainly, guys. He's dead. He's really dead. All right, let me just use your language. But for your sakes... I'm glad I wasn't there, which boggles the mind, right? You're glad, Jesus? You're glad you weren't there to rescue him in his time of need when they were crying out? You're glad you weren't there? Yeah. Why? So that you may, there's the word again, believe. Like I, I, I don't need you to understand it. I just need you to believe. Then he continues, he says, but let's go to him. Let's go. Then Thomas, this is hilarious. Thomas, also known as Didymus, he's the doubting Thomas, said to the rest of the disciples, well, let us also go that we may die with him. This is the Eeyore of the Bible right here, Thomas, right? Thomas is like, well, if you all got to go sometime, might as well be now. Let's all just go be with, you know what I mean? Let me tell you something about these kind of people in your life. You don't need them. You need to get away from these people in your life who are, who are constantly doubting your future, doubting your God, doubting your dreams, never thinking, I'm telling you, you need to choose your friends wisely because they'll steal your dreams, they'll steal your hopes, they'll steal your future. That's a different message. We'll get into it some other time. But you need to watch out for these people. And then on his arrival, it says, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And that's an important note. There's not one single detail in your Bible that's put there by accident. It's put there on purpose. See, the author, John, wants us to know that there was four days because the Jewish tradition, the Jewish believes that the spirit of a person would hover over their body for three days. And then, on, and then after that, they would be really dead. Have you ever seen The Princess Bride? You know, where, where he was just mostly dead. You know what I mean? He's not really dead. The fourth day, he's like, dead dad, okay? And so listen, Jesus waited till that day to where he was not mostly dead. He was dead dead. Jesus waited for that day to do his miracle, to show up. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and so it didn't take them that long to make the trek. And many Jews had come to the funeral, to Martha and Mary, to comfort them in their loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, look what she did. She went out to meet him. One translation says she ran out like she was so excited at just the possibility of, of Jesus coming on the scene to do something. She runs out, but check this out, but Mary stayed at home. I don't know about you, but I, I can relate sometimes more to Mary in this verse, to Martha. I don't know if you, ever get, if you ever get to the place where you're like, God, you didn't show up for me. Why should I show up for you? Okay, God, God, you didn't come through the way I thought you should come through. Or when you thought, why should I? And so many people give up on their belief. They've given up on believing because God did not come through the way you thought he would come through for you. Some people have given up on going, why should I show up to church if you didn't show up for me when I needed you in my marriage, when I needed you in my life, when I needed you in that situation? Why should I show up for you? I don't know if you can relate to Mary in this situation where she stayed at home. She says, I'm not going, but Martha, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, which is true. But she continues, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she, she says to him, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. But um, Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus tells her, Jesus says, no, 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 you don't get it. This ain't gonna happen Someday, this is, this is not an event in the future. All right, listen to me, church. The resurrection does not need to happen someday. It can happen today. Because, because Easter is not an event. It's not a holiday you celebrate, get the family together and have a, uh, have a barbecue. Easter is a person. Res Jesus says, I am resurrection. I, and if you just lean into me, man, I, you would experience so much more in life and what I could do in your life. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he says, he, he says that same word three times in this last verse. He says, the one who believes in me can have this life. Not, not the one who goes to church enough or serves enough, gives enough, memorizes about, prays enough. 
No, I don't need you to understand this all. I just need you to believe in me. You're going to live, and though you be in a box one day, you'll, you'll never die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says the simplicity of the gospel. I know maybe your perspective or your perception may have been different today, but I'm hoping today to shift that, that you would see the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel. He asked the simple question, do you believe this? And I realize that it's hard sometimes. And life gets hard sometimes. And even like if you come to church very often, it's easy to kind of just put things aside and pretend they're not there and to go through kind of the motions and stuff. And my hope, though, is that this resurrection today, that you would simply believe, that, you would, that, that something would be awakened and let Jesus rescue you from death to life. I, I love watching TED Talks and sermons. It's kind of like a hobby of mine. I, lo- I like watching communicators and listening to them. And I was watching a TED Talk a while back of this guy by the name of Sir Kenneth Robinson. He did a TED Talk on what's wrong with education. And he was explaining that it's really not, it's not the teachers, it's not the curriculum. You don't need to change all that. It's actually the atmosphere. And he said it's the atmosphere. It's the environment that the kids are in will determine if they're going to learn or not, which I happen to believe. But he ends his talk, his TED talk, with a story that I want to share with you. He, he lives in California. He lives in Death Valley. In Death Valley, it's called that because it's literally dead. It's the hottest, driest place in the entire nation. In fact, I brought a picture. This is what Death Valley looks like right here. Dead. You know, nothing lives there. Nothing can live there. It's dead, dry, cracked, ugly, barren. It's over. But in December of 2004, a weather pattern happened that has never happened before, at least in recorded history. And rain fell. Seven inches of rain fell at once. And although nothing happened immediately, like all at once, the very next spring, Easter of 2005, they, are you ready for it? They, they found that underneath the surface, Death, Death Valley really wasn't dead. It was dormant. That underneath the surface was potential, was seed, looking, waiting for a resurrection day waiting for the proper atmosphere and environment for life to happen. And that's what we've tried to do today is just to create an environment that's full of God's spirit and resurrection power because every single one of us has a seed planted in our hearts and our lives waiting to come alive. And I'm praying this prayer for you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. I pray this prayer very often for our church here. I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who what? Who believe, not help those who who help themselves, not help those who have figured it out, help those who, you know, have done good enough. No, all I need you to do is believe in him. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Like God wants to awaken something inside of you today. And all you need to do is believe. See, Easter is not an event it can actually be a personal experience. You can experience Easter today. You can experience resurrection today. Everything that is dead, that is dying, God wants to bring to life. Let me close with one scripture. One more, it's not in your notes. John chapter three, verse 16 and 17. A lot of you know this verse, but I'm gonna read to you in a new translation, the Passion Translation. I love how it brings it out. It says this, For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who what? That's it. Everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience resurrection life. We'll experience new life. God did not send his son into the world to judge it. God's not mad at you. That picture you have of God, that perspective you have of religion or church is not the God you and I serve. He's not the God of all creation. He's not mad at you. He sent his son not to judge it, not to condemn the world, but to be its savior, to rescue you. That's why he came. That's why, that's what we've tried to do here is to create an atmosphere and environment where resurrection life can happen simply by belief. Here's how we want to close this service. I know it might be a little bit weird, but can everyone take out that Easter response survey one more time? Go ahead and take that out. 
everyone who's part of the family, dream team, and everybody, take this out. Because on the back of that card, it says Easter response. And there's four letters, A, B, C, and D. Every one of you that are here today, you are in one of these four categories in your life. This is, you are, you are in one of these four. And I'm going to explain what each one is. And if, and if that's you, if you're in one of these categories, just check off or circle the area that corresponds to you. And here's what they mean. Here's what the A means. I'll show you. A means this, that I, I'm already in a relationship with Jesus. And some of you, a lot of you here today are. You say, man, I, pastor, I love Jesus. I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers or anything, but I know I have a personal relationship with him. I know I'm, gonna be, I'm going home to heaven one day. I love Jesus. And I celebrate with you today, man, on this Resurrection Sunday that you are alive in Christ. And if that's you, check off that box. But there's another category, the B, that some of you may fit into. And that's where we're saying, well, today I'm believe, I'm beginning a real relationship with Jesus. And some of you are beginning that today. Maybe, maybe you came into this place and you had a false perception, a false idea of what faith or God or church was. And today you're going to take me up on that challenge to give God one year. It won't take that long, but to give God a chance and to see if he will not bring life to those areas that need to be awakened inside of you, the areas that seem like it's over and it's barren and there's nothing can live there, like God wants to bring resurrection power. He wants you to flourish. And some of you need that today, or maybe you need to do it again and say, oh, you know what? I got off track, but I'm beginning again today to put my faith in Jesus to begin a relationship. And that's, if that's you, check off that side, that be uh, there's another one, C. Some of you may be in that ca category that simply, I'd like to consider it a bit more, Pastor. It was a good talk and all. You almost convinced me. You almost convinced me, Pastor. But I need to consider it a bit more. Can I tell you something? Absolutely, if that's you, absolutely, yes, you can. The reason why we started Discovery was for this category right here. It wasn't for your A's. It's not for the B. It's actually for the C's. For those of you that are here that are going, is this a safe place for me to just figure out faith? To, uh, to figure out if, if God, Jesus, church, I, I don't get it. I need, I need a safe place to figure it out. This is a, look, we're not going to ask you for anything. We're not going to ask you to serve anybody, give any, anything to anybody, to do anything. This is a place where you can just come and figure this faith thing out. If that's you and you're in that place where you're like, man, I'm just, I'm considering. I'm still seeking truth. Go ahead and check off that C if that's you. That last category, there's always a few that are in this category. The D category simply says, I don't ever intend on making that decision. Okay, I wasn't even paying attention to you. My, I was, yeah, I was dragged here by my mom. Whatever it was or whatever, however you found yourself in here today, if that's you where you're like, I just don't care about this. I'm waiting for lunch. I'm waiting for, if that's you, here's what I want to say. Just be man enough or woman enough or strong enough or courageous enough to check the box, man. All right? All right, just check the box, because here's, uh, we're going to, we, every, every, the, day, the Sunday after Easter, I'll share with you the results of all these we can celebrate together, and it's always really cool to see, year after year, and we measure this, how many people that used to be a D went up to C or B, or how many people were at C went to, went to a B, and, and you may not like this, you in the D category, um, but I'm going to be praying for you. Okay, and you may not think it's going to work or do anything, and so it's not going to hurt you anyway, but I'm going to be praying for you because I believe that prayer works. I'm going to be praying for you, your life, your family, your relationships. I'm going to be praying that God would reveal himself to you in a way that only you would know he's God. And he's not demanding anything for you. He's not, he's not trying to, to, to make you good. No, he's trying to make you alive. That's all. That's it. And so if you do me a favor, go ahead and finish filling out your Easter response. Give us the information, your next spiritual step, A, B, C, or D. Go ahead and finish that. And then when you're done, when you're done, just leave it in your lap and look up at me, and I'll know that you're finished and we're ready to conclude the service in prayer and with some final announcements. So go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. And then just leave it in your lap, and then we're going to have some time of prayer. Amen. All right. All right, thank you guys so much. Come on, let's bow our heads and pray together this Resurrection Sunday. Some of you are here.